Hey, West Side Dan Sutherland here to introduce week three of What If the Church. Our series is entitled Called, and we looked in week one at the idea that we're called to look up in prayer. Last week, Troy McMahon taught us about the idea that we are called to be different, to take action. And this week, we're talking about the idea from Matt Miller that we are to go in. Matt's going to talk about this concept that the church shouldn't live on the defensive. We ought to be on the offensive. We have a task to do, a God who's behind us, a great resource in each other to make a difference in the spiritual landscape of Kansas City. You'll remember Matt, he's the guy that's planting a church with us, Westside Family Church, and with Restore Community Church, and with Olathe Bible Church, three churches together doing one church plant, first time in Kansas City history. You're going to join my friend and soon to be the pastor of New City Church, Matt Miller. God bless you, church. Good morning, Westside. Awesome. As Pastor Dan said, my name is Matt Miller, and it is an honor to be with you guys today. Um, I'm get to I have the opportunity to speak uh, to you guys for a couple of reasons. One being through What If the Church. Uh, today is kind of the final day of What If as we gather this afternoon. And as a part of What If the Church, we've been doing this little stage swap or church swap, whatever you want to call it. So today's my day at Westside. But more importantly than that, one of the cool reasons that I get to be here is because I'm going to be your baby. Have you ever had a better looking kid? I mean, come on, right? Westside's history, 35 years. I'm going to be, uh, as one of the pastors of New City Church, uh, I'm going to be uh, your church plant. We're going to be planting off of 75th Street. The church's name, of course, is New City Church. And uh, man, we are excited. I've got, man, I've got like this great news I want to share because something really cool happened just yesterday, but I can't share it yet. You know, we're waiting for a final thing. So maybe next month when I speak to you guys, I can be able to celebrate that. But man, I, I want to tell you, it's like, you know, it's like one of those deals. I can't keep a secret worth a flip, right? But uh, next, next time, next time. But man, great stuff is happening within the church. And I want to say uh, as an encouragement to you guys, each time that you choose to give that green rectangle stuff in your wallet or in your purse towards the impact area of Westside Family, you are giving to help start churches like, like mine. And I want to say thank you as a part of the team. I appreciate the heart. I appreciate your giving that you, the sacrifices that you're giving to things outside of yourself. And I know this, some of you, some of you may be with New City because you live in the area that we're going to plan and God's nudging your heart in that area. And I hope today maybe something you hear will help kind of help push you across that line. We are going to talk, as Pastor Dan said, about the church's battle cry. As you see, I'm wearing a heat shirt. Any heat fans in the room today? Any Mav Maverick fans? Anybody care less about basketball? That's okay. That's okay. If you don't pull for either, just pull for the heat. We're actually going to have a prayer vigil today, immediately following, because they must win tonight or the Mavs win the series. Me and Pastor Dan, we have this in common. We both want the heat to win, but if there was a second team that we would want to win behind the heat, it would be the Mavs. Dan, because he's from Texas. Me, because I like Mark Cuban. So, you know... But I'm pulling for my heat. But the reason I'm wearing this shirt is it does go into the context of today's message. The church these days has a battle cry, right? You're aware of this battle cry. It's what? Jesus. That was a little lame. Even the non-basketball people know this. All right, let's try it again. Ready? Jesus. Wake up. Here we go. Jesus. Who's saying Dallas? Somebody's saying Dallas. It's defense, right? And listen, this is the church's battle cry is defense. And we're really good at it, right? We're really good about defense. We are all about asking for protection. We're all about keeping things away, about protecting the things in our life. And I want to give a little pushback today on the defense battle cry of the church. Because I believe this. I don't believe. I don't believe that Jesus came and gave his life for a people to be on the defensive. And I don't believe and I refuse to believe that Jesus came and commissioned a church. He started the church through 12 ordinary guys so that they could be very, very good at defense. I've got to believe that God had something more in mind. And so this morning, we're going to kind of just jump in here and talk about how the church can play offense. Now, let's give some scripture background to kind of this idea. If you want to look in your Bible, it's going to be on the screen. It's also in your tear-off in your bulletin if you want to pull that out. We're going to look in Matthew 16 first. 
And in Matthew 16, here's the, con- the context. Jesus' disciples have gathered around him, and Jesus has taken a straw poll. He wants to know what is the people saying about him? What's his popularity? What are the people saying about who he is and what he's doing? And then he asks them this question. But okay, forget what other people are saying. Who do you say I am? What do you, you 12 guys who are with me all the time, what do you say about me? And look what, how Peter responds right away. He says this. Well, Peter says this. It's not in your, in your, in your uh, scripture. Peter says, you are the Messiah, the living son of God. And Jesus says, ding, 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 you got it right, right? And no one has revealed this to you, Peter, except for the Father in heaven. And then he makes this statement found in verse 18. This is the rock on which I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not, not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. The two ideas real quick from the scripture that, I, that will help us uh, build on today's, today's talk is one is the church was not created for defense. The church was not created for defense, if you want to write that in. And the second thing is this is that we are playing against the defense. You were created for offense. These little C and these big C churches, this is lingo of Westside family, correct? These little C churches like Westside and this big C churches, the churches all over the world, we were not created for this defense mentality. We were created for offense. We were created to score for the kingdom. But we are playing against an extremely gifted and talented and experienced defense. And if you're, you're, you're extremely misled as a believer, if you think that as you're going about life and as you're trying to score for the kingdom, that the enemy is going to simply let you drive by him for the easy layup. Get this, you're going to get fouled. You're going to get fouled. But notice what Jesus says, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. A gate is all about defense, and this is what Jesus says. Hell's best defense can't stop the church. Now, that's exciting because, listen, we, we go with this mentality that, yes, we can be stopped. We've been stopped. Yes, we've we got to play defense. we got to keep the enemy off our territory. we got to pray for our schools. we got to pray for protection for our family. And those things are great, right? But Jesus would say, listen, we're on the offense. We're going to score and know people, no church, that hell's best defense can't stop you. Families, when you're trying to score for Jesus, hell's best defense can't stop you. And so that's where we're kind of going to go today. So let's kind of jump in. Here's three offensive opportunities, three offense opportunities. And here's the punchline. It's you, it's family, and it's city. You, family, city. Let's jump in right now. Let's talk about you. The enemy has done a phenomenal job in your life of knocking the ball out of your hand. Did you know that if you don't have the ball in your hand, you can't score? Some of you are frozen. You, 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 you used to take these big steps for Jesus. You used to be pretty aggressive with, with, the, with your faith. But something has happened along the way. You have been maybe fouled one too many times, and you've kind of said, you know what, I'm just going to kind of dribble. And God did not call you to dribble. He did not call me to dribble. He called you not to score. Now, the Bible says that you have an enemy, right? If you look in John chapter 10, verse 10, you will find this about, about your enemy. It says that the Bible says that the enemy's um, purpose is to steal, to kill, and destroy. He wants to not trip you up. He wants to destroy your life. Now, I have two little girls. I have Allie and Christy. They're twin two-year-olds, right? Here's a picture of them, and they are stinking adorable. They're beautiful. That's... Yeah, right? I know you're like, man, why can't my kids look like that, right? (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's Luke in the middle. The twins just turned two uh, in April, and Luke was born in April, so we're busy. (laughs) But the Bible, leave leave the picture up there, but the Bible says something also about our enemy. In 1 Peter, Peter says that our enemy is like a roaring lion. Now, when I ask Allie and Christy, what sound does a lion make, what do they say? Yeah, and it's cute, right? Hey, Allie, what's a lion say? Rawr. And we laugh. It's still funny, right? Christy, what's a lion say? She goes, rawr. It's cute. Truth is this. This is a lion roaring. This is what a lion roaring looks like. Look at this next picture. That ain't cute. If that's in front of you and that happens, you know what? You need to be running. You need to be running fast because those big old teeth and the saliva's dripping off of them and the ferociousness of it. And here's the, what the enemy does. Peter says that the enemy is like a roaring lion. And he gets right in the middle of your life, right in the middle of your situation, right in the middle of your dream, right in the middle of your faith, right in the middle of your trust, and he roars, rawr, 
but it's not cute. It's flipping scary. And we tend to freeze whatever we're doing because we're so intimidated by the lion's roar. Peter says that the enemy is like a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion. The enemy's main job at defeating you and keeping you from scoring as a person is intimidation. Why you can't score. It looks too difficult to score. It's going to hurt when I go in. I don't know if I want the fouls in my life. And because of that thought, that thought, so many of us have just settled for, for dribbling. And then we see the goal, but it is so scary. It is so scary. It is so intimidating to pursue what God has called you to do. And I believe this. God has called each and every one of you with a passion, with a dream that's in your heart. There is something within you, and maybe it's just a little, little spark now because the years have, have you've been fouled too much, and that once was a flame, it's now a little spark. But i got to believe if Scripture is true, God has put something in each of your little hearts, each of your lives, and the enemy is doing everything in his power to keep you from fanning that back into a flame. But I want to encourage you this morning, maybe Deuteronomy 31 will do it. Maybe I want to inspire you through Deuteronomy 31. In Deuteronomy 31, we find Joshua. Joshua has just been handed over the reins of the Israelite people from Moses. Moses, you ever heard of him? Big time leader in Old Testament, right? Done a lot of great things, and now comes Joshua. And Joshua has this task. He's taken these people into this new land. And if you remember, Joshua was a spy that once went into the land to see what it was like. So he knows what's waiting for them. And as this new leader with this new dream, with this new responsibility, with this new command from God to go, he's scared. He's intimidated. The enemy in his life is roaring in his life, and he is afraid. And you can just see Joshua knowing what he wants to do, what his heart is calling him to do, but he's just, can he do it? And look how the Lord responds to, jo uh, to Joshua. And in truth, this is how the Scripture is alive, church is this is what the Lord wants to say to you this morning as well. If you're kind of stuck, if you're kind of uninspired, listen, this is not a motivational speak. Did you know that Jesus commissioned each and every one of you, if you're a Jesus follower, to go in the, in the Great Commission, right? He said go. He doesn't say stay. He doesn't say wait. He says to go. And the enemy doesn't want you to go. The enemy wants you to stay. He wants you to wait. And Joshua, thousands of years earlier, was facing the same dilemma you were. Can I do this? And look what the Lord says to, to Joshua. He says, The Lord will hand over to you the people who live there, and you must deal with them as I have commanded you. So be, what's that word? Oh. And? Let's say it again. The first word is? Oh. And the second? Gracious. Now, if you read that whole little section in your scriptures later, you will notice that the Lord tells Joshua several times, not once, not twice, several times, to be strong and courageous. Why? Because Joshua was far from any, being strong and far from being courageous. And some of us, it's the exact same way. But the Lord says, be strong and courageous, exclamation point. It's like the writer of that day knew, hey, this means something. This is important. He says, do not be afraid and do not panic before them. Are you afraid? Are you panicking? For the Lord your God will send somebody, will call in a favor. No. Right? Think about that. It says, the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Can I tell you something? When God tells you and I that I'm going to go before you and I'm going to do this for, on your behalf, I'm going to give you a little secret on Scripture. God wins. <laughs> Every time. People talk all the time about Moses when he previously set the 12, the, the 12 spies in and 10 of them came back with a negative report. We can't take it. And that's why they spent 40 years, right? My question always is this. Why did Moses even send in the spies? Because God had already told him to take the land. The spies were irrelevant. Just go. And it's the same thing with Joshua. Now it's his turn to go, and he's afraid. And the Lord says, be strong and courageous because I'm personally going before you. Listen, God sets the screen in your life. God throws the block so that you and I can continue to score, to advance the ball, not for your glory, not because you're super talented, but because Jesus has called, commissioned, and commanded us to do something significant for the kingdom. Listen, your church is doing something significant for the kingdom, right? But did you know this, that, the, that God has also commissioned you, little OU, normal OU, to do something significant for the kingdom, there are people in your neighborhood, in your schools, in your household even, who if it's not for you, 
they will never experience the life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. And so if you sit back and dribble the ball and say, I'm going to let Westside score on that one, or maybe this church over here will score on that one, or maybe that church plant new city, maybe they'll go talk to them. Here's the deal. Eh, wrong. It is your responsibility to be in their life and to ignore the roaring line. And if he fouls you, big deal. Get back up and keep going. And say, listen, God has called me for something significant here. Little old you. Score. Score a basket. Win for the kingdom. Now, from that one, we go right into the second, the family. Because the enemy does such a great job of knocking the ball out of your hand, because the enemy does such a great job of keeping you from scoring, it's led to a tremendous breakdown in our family. Our families are all about defense. Our families are all about staying away from this mean, old, evil world. I've been inspired this week. There's a school in our area called Shawano Elementary. It's going to be a school that we hope to do a lot for and partner with in a lot of great ways. And when I first moved here and I started learning about the school, Shawano is a Title I school, and within this school it has 19 spoken languages. It's on the corner of Neiman and 75th Street. And as I was talking to some people in my neighborhood, here's the story that I was hearing, is I was hearing about people who were pulling their kids out of Shawano because they were the only white kids in the class. That's what, that's what I had a guy tell me. I pulled my kids out of there because they were the only white kids in the class. This week, in the past four weeks, I've heard this story from different families some of the families that actually attend Westside that have said, you know what, we have chosen to send our kids to Shawano. There's even one family that I met recently that said that they're taking one of their children out of the private Christian school in the area and they're sending them to Shawano because of the ministry opportunity that presents itself there with that family and with that school. The family's got a breakdown because we're afraid. We're afraid of diversity. We're afraid of all these little things, and we tend to pull back because of the what-ifs and the unknowns, and we go into this defense mentality. We play defense with our family. we got to protect. we got to protect. And you know what? Yes, you have to protect. I'm not talking about being foolish. But at the same time, we don't retreat. Make sure that your defense is not retreat because you're afraid. And that God has opportunities for there. My friend Chris and Rachel, they just moved into the area from northeast Arkansas, and they rented a, a house here for the next year as they're looking to purchase. And uh, I learned something, and I kind of shared this when I spoke with Pastor Dan a few weeks ago. But we would go up to all these homes, up to five homes on one Saturday. And man, these homes had phenomenal lawns, and they were painted real nice, and had a, a nice car in the garage and that sort of thing. But when we would walk into the house, you know what? It, it was like chaos, I mean, I don't know if you manage, if you're here today and you manage some rental properties or you do some stuff in the real estate, but the outside doesn't always match the inside. You know, maybe Jesus would call it the modern day whitewashed tomb, that the outside of our neighborhood looks really, really good, but inside the family's falling apart. And if there's any area, church, where Jesus wants us, the Christ following moms and dads, husbands and wives, to step and take the offense, if it's within, excuse me, it's within the family. And it's not walking over and hitting your neighbor on the head with a Bible and telling them what they should do, right? That doesn't work. What it is is showing our neighbors, showing our family friends what it looks like for a mom and dad, for a husband and wife that lives for Jesus. Again, let's go back to Joshua. Now Joshua is the king of the people. He's in charge. He's taking the land. And now he's got all these people around him who have been uh, kind of um, saturated with all these other cultures that were in the land. And they're struggling. These people are struggling on who they're going to follow. And so look what Joshua says in Joshua 24, 15 to these people. He's telling them in this big speech, he says, But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. And you see the little dot, dot, dot. He goes on and he mentions some cultures. He mentions some ways of life in that area. And he says, listen, if you're not going to serve the Lord, and you're not going to be on the offensive for the Lord and what the Lord has called us to do as a people, then choose today who you're going to follow and follow that. If you're going to follow this style of culture, church, then you know what? Just align yourself with them and go. I'm a Heat fan. I'm not a Mavs fan. You're not going to see me wearing a Maverick shirt. I'm a Hurricane fan. I will never wear any Gator junk, right? You're not going to see that happen. I have aligned myself. You know what else? I'm married. I'm aligned myself with my wife. This ring shows that. And something else, I've been baptized. And when I was baptized, that showed all my friends and family that were there that I have aligned myself to this Jesus and to this faith of Christianity. You know what? So me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, what does that look like? It looks like in your neighborhood. I have a small neighborhood. But I'm in a cul-de-sac of three homes. Pretty small, right? 
If I can't do it there, I don't need to be doing this at all. One of my neighbors, I mow their yard because I want to help the guy out. And the other neighbors, man, they have kids that are small. And we're getting to know them. We haven't gotten to the spiritual conversations yet at all. But they're great people. But I want to be a model. I don't want to tell them what Jesus says. I want to show them what Jesus says about how to do life. Choose today who you will serve. And Joshua goes on to say, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Is that your mantra? Is that your battle cry that, you know what, for me, in my situation, where I am in life, I'm not going to be intimidated by the roar of the lion. I am going to let my family be the light. Jesus tells, tells his disciples that when you pray to get alone by yourself in a private place where you can concentrate, and it's not for show. But then he tells his disciples to pray in private, but this, is that when you go do life, it's like don't hide your light under a bow, but live your life in such a way for all men and all women to see. Church, when it comes to the family, we need to get outside the safety of our four walls where it's safe and we have a lot of defense and we're really protected in there. And we need to take a big mother may I step into our communities, into our neighborhoods and say, listen, I'm coming out in a different way. <laughs> I'm coming out. I'm not going to be ashamed of the gospel. I'm not going to be ashamed anymore of who I say I align myself with. And listen, this is the deal. Jesus has good news to say to your neighbors. It's not bad news. Jesus has freedom to offer to your neighbors, not more restraints and more restrictions. There is freedom in Christ. He says, take upon me my yoke because it's easy. My burden is light. Listen, God has freed this life up here, and he's done the same thing in your life. When you think about the old you and the Jesus you, there's something special in that. Why do we want to hide it and play the defensive? Let's get out and let's say, listen, this is what it looks like to love God. And as for me and my family, this is how we serve the Lord. And we can do it. And the enemy's going to roar, and he's going to shake his nasty old paws at you, and you're going to get some scars, and you're going to get some scrapes. I guarantee it. But here's the deal. You drive, you drive, you drive, and then you do one of those big old behind-the-back 360 slam dunks, and you score for the kingdom. Because in the midst of your foul, in the midst of you getting pushed down and knocked down by your enemy, that is the greatest opportunity for you to score for the kingdom of God. Because most people, when they get hurt, and when they get pushed down, and when they get fouled, they quit. And they say, well, there must not be a God, because how would God ever allow this to happen to me? Not us. Not this people. Foul or no foul, we're getting up, and we're doing this, because there's a lot riding on it. Which is the third piece. It's the city. And right now, the city's the easiest one. Today at 4 o'clock, we're going to be gathering. 30 churches are gathering, pulling their people together to celebrate what God is doing in the city through the Big C Church. We're going to be gathering at Livestrong Live Stadium, which is at the Legends area by the big NASCAR track. Go Jeff Gordon. That's where we're going to be. All right. I'm a NASCAR fan too. I just don't want to wear a NASCAR shirt up here because that's just a little too redneck. All right. <laughs> I'm a redneck. I'm, I'm there, but I'm not. Anyway, so we're going to be here. Uh, please bring a lawn chair, something to sit on. All right. It's going to be a great day. I know the team here at Westside is playing a significant role there. It's going to be a great opportunity for us to come and show our city what it looks like when churches work together when we love each other. It's time. It's time to no longer be stuck. It's time to be inspired for what God has called and commissioned you to do. God expects it. Not because Matt Miller got up and said something. It's because God has commissioned you to go, to go and baptize, to go and make disciples, to go and teach people what it looks like to live for him. And today, let today be the first day. Let today be the first day that you not only dribble, but you dribble towards the goal with your intention in mind that I am going to score Again, not for me, not for my greatness, not to make my name great, but I'm going to score because that is what God has commanded me to do. I want to pray for you this morning. Pray two things. These are scary, but I'm going to pray and I hope you would receive it. That God would give you boldness and that he would put his hand on your life in such a way that the people around you would have no excuse but to know that God is with you. Can I pray that for you? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for Westside Family Church. Thank you for the people here who are helping make this new little church, new city church, a reality. God, thank you. And God, I pray for these people the same thing that I pray for the people of New City, that you would give us great boldness. God, let us not be afraid of who we are. And God, I pray also that you would use us in such ways that the people around us would have no excuse to say, but to say that that person, that man, that woman, that boy, that girl, they walk with Jesus. God, that's our prayer God, I pray you would bless us with answering that. Boldness in your hand. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.